hi there. I'm not sure if this is being recorded out in the cyberspace, but it's Alec McKenzie off camera, uh, the, the least attractive of the panel and asked to sit off camera. We have uh, uh, to the viewers going from left to right, Dr. Kathy Sabota from Utah, Dr. Christopher Larson from Missouri, Dr. Arthur Burgess from, from Columbus, Ohio, as well as Dr. Brian Casper. Uh, Dr. Burgess's aide from Columbus, Ohio as well, and then Dr. Adrian Craner uh, uh, from Cold Spring Harbor, New York. And uh, we have expertise in, in clinical trials, the molecular genetics of SMA, mouse models of SMA, uh, gene therapy for SMA, as well as a new uh, antisense oligotherapy for SMA represented in this rather impressive panel. So. Uh, we welcome uh, uh, any question that can, uh, you want to send over uh, from cyberspace. In the interim, uh, I might just pitch out to um, Dr. Lorson and ask him uh, what he f uh, felt about today's meeting, what were some of the more I exciting uh, observations or presentations that uh, you saw, Chris? Well, I think things <clears throat> have really advanced in the last 12 months. And one of the things that really stuck out is that we actually are moving into clinical trials, you know, or that we're on the cusp of clinical trials for a variety of different kinds of therapeutics. And having opportunities to address SMA at different points, whether it's for splicing an ASO correction or for, or for small compounds or small molecules that correct splicing, or even for gene therapy. These are all excellent opportunities, and to be pushing them forward from preclinical miles, uh, models into <clears throat> phase one into actual clinical trials, I think, is outstanding. And that's something that really jumped out. And it's not just mouse modeling anymore. It's actually moving these things from truly from the, the bench to the bedside. OK, thanks very much for that. Maybe uh, we could just put both Adrian and Brian on the spot as exemplars of two of the more interesting and promising therapies. Uh, Adrian, perhaps I could start with you. C could you give an overview of Antisense, uh, Oligo, and, and where we are today with that? Um, okay, so yeah, Antisense, Oligo, or ASO therapy is meant to correct splicing so that the SMN2 gene can, uh, can uh, express higher levels of full-length SMN protein. Um, this uh, approach works, for, it's very effective in the mouse models. Um, the uh, one particular type of uh, ASO that uh, is ma manufactured at Isis Pharmaceuticals has been tested in, in, uh, in monkeys for safety as well, and clinical trials have started already in December in, in uh, three centers nationally. And, and, um, Perhaps somebody else can comment on that. Those are trials to, to uh, establish that the compound is safe in humans and that um, uh, to begin to establish the appropriate dose to give that might be effective. Right. So things are moving along quite nicely. And, and so the first trial, quite small with a total of, and, and Kathy, uh, your, your site is involved in that. It, it, how, what, what's, how many study entrants and, and are you guys full? So uh, the study is divided into um, enrollment of four different dosing cohorts. So we're going to progressively increase the dose with each group. And so there's six children in each of the first three groups, and then probably at least eight children in the fourth group. Um, and so hopefully by the end of the year, that trial will come to completion. And that's an initial phase one safety trial. Right, right. And then it'll be up, to, uh, depending on the findings there, uh, uh, whether it'll be ramped up and extended thereafter. Right. I think, I mean, I think we're entering as, just to um, build on what, what Dr. Lorson said, I think we're entering a new era um, where we're finally, um, we, over the past five to six years, we've spent an extensive amount of time as a community preparing for clinical trials, um, trying to um, examine our clinical outcome measures, pick the best outcome measures and try to understand how we're going to take this diverse group of patients that we see, which ranges all the way from um, uh, severely weak infants to adults with SMA, and, uh, and effectively study these new treatments. Um, 
But I think we're entering a new era this year, finally, where these new therapies we've been hearing about that have been in animal models and cell models are finally moving into the clinic. And ISIS is the first of many compounds, I think, that we're going to see advancing in the next uh, few months. And just, uh, well, we've gotten just two questions in um, um, by snail mail, it seems, uh, and Kathy. So we will stick with you before, Brian, we have you talk about the, the, the gene therapy situation. Kathy, the first question, and I'm sorry to pick on you, but they're both fairly clinical. Uh, tonsil and adenoid surgery, can this benefit children who struggle with uh, cho the, with choking issues, and so yeah. I, I think that um, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is very um, is a very specific um, issue with the individual child, but um, definitely one of the things we see in our children with SMA is that we see that they have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, because they have lower tone in the muscles of the throat, and so sometimes when they go to sleep, uh, they can have sleep disorder breathing. And if that's the case, and a sleep study confirms that it's altering their breathing, it's really important to get those tonsils and adenoids removed. If it's um, because of a history of recurrent infections, um, where um, there's recurrent sore throats, it's less clear whether tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is helpful. Uh, so I think it depends on, you should talk about that with your individual doctor, but in general it's uh, safe, uh, well tolerated, and in the proper setting can be a, a uh, beneficial surgery in some cases. And sort of in addition to that, uh, this individual was told that braces and uh, dental work uh, was not, uh, such as retainers, uh, 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 not to do this for children with SMA for breathing reasons. Uh, um, is there any? Check. So this is difficult um, because it depends on how weak or strong the child is. Um, many of our children uh, who are at the weaker end of the spectrum, be they uh, type 2 uh, who's, um, who is having some trouble chewing uh, or a type 1 who's gotten a, a permanent jaw contracture, that's a challenging issue and um, there's a limited number of things we can do in that setting but if there's a significant overbite or if the jaw contracture threatens the ability to safely ventilate the child, I think that um, perhaps the best thing to do is to consult with a specialized uh, multidisciplinary group. And most children's hospitals have such groups. Um, they're often called craniofacial clinics. And they will have, um, as part of their team, um, a, um, a ear, nose, and throat physician. They'll have a dentist and an orthodontist. And I think, um, especially because some of our children have special risks with surgery, it's important to consult that kind of a multidisciplinary team when your regular orthodontist or dentist is giving you advice that you're not comfortable with. Great. Thanks very much. Now, a, a, a wide leap, a great leap, Brian, to you perhaps to give us an update on your exciting gene therapy initiative. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm very happy to, um, you know, uh, state that we have made phenomenal advancements towards moving towards the clinic and, and part of my job has been to create a compelling case to, towards the Food and Drug Administration that AUV9 delivery, so our gene delivery, targets motor neurons in a wide spectrum of, of time points. So we have motor neuron targeting in non-human primates out to three years of age which is quite exciting. The window of opportunity in the mouse, uh, which showed a very small window, does not seem to be the case. So we can target motor neurons, which is the, the main cell type uh, in SMA for targeting, uh, without a window of opportunity. Uh, secondly, uh, our goal was to demonstrate to the Food and Drug Administration, uh, before we really started marching towards the uh, sanction studies that AEV9 SMN overexpression was safe and well tolerated. And we've spent quite a bit of time in mouse and non-human primates to prove that indeed this was safe and well tolerated. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Jerry Mandel, Arthur Burgess, and, and our whole clinical team uh, prepared a very lengthy packet that went to the FDA for a systemic gene delivery trial in what's called a pre-investigational new drug application. And we had a very productive meeting with the FDA. We outlined how we're going to produce the clinical product, 
the sorts of studies that we're going to perform uh, that will allow us and allow the agency to grant us the ability to start a phase one, phase two clinical trial. Uh, they agreed with us. They gave us a green light on the sorts of marching orders that we have to uh, perform to actually get IND, investigational new drug application clearance. Uh, what's very exciting for me and what was presented at the meeting was the aspect that we are starting those FDA sanctioned studies next week, uh, within the next week and a half, uh, at our contract uh, research laboratories. And this is, will be the start of a six month study uh, in which we're collecting information to present to the FDA on safety, efficacy, as well as where the drug goes once we deliver it. Uh, so we have our marching orders from the FDA. We're getting ready to um, coordinate the injections of animals and, uh, and are quite excited about this advancement. Likewise, from a, from a research standpoint, uh, we would be the first to admit that we cannot produce virus for very large patients. And we haven't had the exact cutoff on the, the size limitation, but production is an issue. Uh, that being said, uh, we and others, including Chris Lorson's laboratory, has demonstrated that uh, the delivery of AEV9 into the cerebral spinal fluid targets motor neurons quite efficiently. And we are advancing a, or we're attempting to advance a similar and parallel track towards systemic gene delivery as well as a CSF delivered product. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Brian. That was, that was a, a, a great overview. Arthur uh, Burgess, if I could just throw you in the hot seat a bit. Um, this year, for the first time, we had data presented by, among others, Adrian Craner, uh, Charlotte Sumner, um, that showed uh, the possible role of the motor neuron, uh, which we had all assumed forever uh, was the primary role, it may not be that straightforward. Um, I guess it's, it, it's, a very, it's quite controversial, it, it's far from consensus. Um, what are your thoughts and, and why should people care about that uh, in the SMA community? Well, actually I'm going to take a positive spin on it. So what I would say is the data says uh, two things. So some of the data from our lab, some of the data from other people, like Marco Piscini says that um, if you get it into neurons in the CNS, you can get marked correction. The other piece of data is that you can actually have effects outside of the nervous system. So is it the case that there are actually two options for therapeutics whereby Correction in the CNS gives you correction, but actually correction elsewhere in some other tissue that lies outside of the CNS also can give you correction. So if that's, I mean, then it requires further experimentation, but if that turns out to be true, that's actually a benefit, not a, not a negative. Yes, I'm sure we'll have some very vibrant discussions right. uh, on the issues. On the go-forward basis. Um, uh, Dr. Lorson, uh, uh, in addition to uh, Dr. Craner's uh, uh, gene therapy, uh, uh, ASO therapy, and Dr. Casper's gene, uh, gene therapy, um, we also heard uh, from P uh, PTC uh, slash uh, Roche, Roche. Pre pre presenting a small compound. Could you just summarize what Nikolai told us? Okay, well, right. <laughs> uh, but just, um, yeah. I think w without saying anything specific, I think one of the, one of the, the, the um, oh, I see. Right? Uh, yeah, I, I just, but just, uh, just a general overview of the in encouraging trend that we, one well, saw. Well, without saying anything specific, uh, yes. and not speaking for PTC Therapeutics or Roche, um, I think the, the holy grail in terms of a therapeutic would be something that is not invasively delivered. I mean, that, that is ideal. Something that is orally bioavailable and something that has long-term stability. And that is something that seems to be being developed and um, a, a compound that you can take orally 
that actually changes the SMA phenotype would be a, an outstanding breakthrough. And for compounds that have been tested to date, there really hasn't been a strong correlation with mouse models, um, with some of the FDA-approved compounds that have been pulled off the shelf. This would be a, potentially an SMA-specific therapy and also um, perhaps fitting those bills and descriptions right. as well. Okay. Well played, sir. Uh, I have a question uh, from uh, Margaret uh, from Baltimore is uh, a question, I think, for you. Uh, Dr. Soboda, uh, we're at a very, it seems, exciting time with the therapies coming along with at least one in play and, and others on the, uh, on the four. What, from a clinical research point of view, are we well resourced or what are the challenges do you see from that perspective? And what can the SMA community advocate for uh, on the ground? I think that um I think that uh, many of the, the SMA community have really looked forward to the time when um, some of these companies will start to be able to sponsor drug trials, but we have to remember as a community that this is still a relatively rare disease and that we have to continue to actively partner with them in fundraising because uh, as, we, um, as we move to answer all the questions we need to for clinical trials and for designing the best kinds of clinical trials, we need to um, continue to develop our infrastructure so that we have sites available for families across the country so that children don't have to travel too far, particularly if they have uh, type 1 SMA. And I think that some of the work that's been done with Fight SMA and other groups um, is just um, instrumental of the kind of partnership that we need to, to continue to move this forward. So this isn't the time to sit back on our laurels, so to speak. This is the time to really um, show renewed enthusiasm and effort, right. um, and I'm very excited that um, with, with hard work we can we can make it happen. And I would love to see at least um, you know 10 or 20 really high quality SMA research uh, centers that are capable of doing clinical trials um, at a very high level of quality, uh, where we have teams that we're able to support consistently where that um, we can provide excellent care for the families and use whatever uh, other resources, whether they be governmental, uh, whether they be uh, industry supported, whether they be via the new NeuroNext network, uh, whatever strategies we can use to, to help support these networks is, is critical for success. Uh, uh, Joe from Detroit is wondering where we are with the newborn screening uh, uh, initiative. So newborn screening in SMA, um, is, has been a project that has been near and dear to my heart and I think for all of those families with new, newly diagnosed babies, the idea that you could have, um, you know, the opportunity to bring some of these new therapies to your baby before they've had the progressive weakness, that, that's probably the, the um, most exciting thing for the future. That doesn't mean we're going to not pay attention to the symptomatic um, kids and families out there, but it does provide an opportunity to um, to provide a forum for proving that these new drugs work well uh, in a population earlier on in the course of the disease. And I think that um, this is, again, uh, something I think the whole community should support. Right now, um, we are pursuing a pilot trial uh, for newborn screening, and it's been uh, a little bit slower than we had hoped. Uh, we had originally hoped to do three states where we would start launching screening, and we're going to do two states, hopefully starting um, uh, before the end of this year. Um, I think that's a starting point, but the earlier we can diagnose babies, um, uh, you know, as soon as possible after the newborn period is, is going to give us the best chance to help type 1 children in, in particular and to get these exciting therapies the chance to perform to the degree they, they could um, in terms of reaching a cure. So we talk about a treatment versus right. a cure. If we really want to cure SMA, I think the mouse model has told us um, and also um, human studies have showed us that we need to intervene as early and proactively as possible and we also need to maintain proactive care for all of the children and adults out there so that we can keep them uh, in, as, in, in excellent shape so that they can respond to the therapies because we're going to have multiple therapies to, to choose from. And they're going to be via different delivery mechanisms. Some are going to be uh, perhaps stem cells. Some are going to be viral um, gene delivery therapies. Some are going to be orally 
uh, derived therapies. Some perhaps we still haven't really completed the clinical trials we need to on already available FDA approved drugs. But that does take time and resources and infrastructure and I think um, the community has been incredible about allowing those kind of opportunities and I hope we can continue that. Well, thanks forward. very much, Kathy. Mary Ann from California wants to know about the role of stem cells. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to. Arthur? Um, okay, the role of stem cells. I mean, I think what I would say, uh, as it stands today, and that doesn't mean that it can't advance, is that, that you have three therapies, the gene therapy, the small molecules, and the antisense oligos, all have their advantages and uh, disadvantages. So. I don't know that any one at the moment is preferential. They should all go forward. Um, if you look at stem cells, what can stem cells and what have they done to date? So in the animal models that have been very majorly corrected by these other therapies, the stem cells have had less of an impact. So there are, I think there are some fundamental things of the, of the biology that needs to be looked at. So for instance, if I'm going to inject a stem cell, it will give a supportive environment. It will help those motor neurons up there. But can you make it even better? Can you get it to actually grow and replace the motor neuron? Though to date, those studies, they've been tried but I think there's a lot more work in it. So what I would say is I think stem cells would be at a, an earlier stage than these other treatments. They're not as, ad, as advanced or as effective, at least in the animal models, to date. They may be very important later on if you've had loss of motor neurons, can you replace them? But I think we need more fundamental studies on how to do that. I'd just like to add to that a little bit and say um, I think some of the stem cell work is if you take a step back and don't look at it from just the clinical aspect that perhaps some of the cells like the IPS cells where you can differentiate and obtain human motor neurons that this is a great research tool also. And I don't think anybody would question that. And it provides another important context where you can examine drugs, SMN function, and ideally within a context that allows it to be more SMA-like as opposed to perhaps a standard tissue culture cell that isn't a motor neuron. Um, so I think there are also benefits at the biological level, not just at the translational level. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, a question from uh, Michelle who uh, asked uh, about if there's any correlation with nutrition, as in many of the older kids who have issues with metabolic acidosis and mitochondrial function. So I'm, I guess she's asking that, a, that favorite question of the role of diet in SMA, and I apologize, Dr. Sobota. <laughs> so, um, I mean, nutrition is very complicated. I think that we're just beginning to try to understand some of the nutritional problems that our, our SMA patients face. And, I, and there's, um, the, you can break this down into several levels. There's a problem in metabolism in general in that most SMA patients have a lower metabolic rate. Therefore, they gain fat mass more readily. Uh, they have a lower rate of breaking down um, uh, proteins and carbohydrates and fats. Um, and I think that that translates uh, to um, both a tendency to be overweight in some populations of SMA, children and adults, and a tendency to, to um, at the same time in babies with SMA1 uh, um, who have bulbar and swallowing problems to have um, the, uh, uh, trouble keeping up with their calorie needs. And so I think that um, there's no single one approach for any given child um, I, I think that um, every uh, SMA child should have at each clinical visit um, an assessment of their nutritional intake. There's certain problems that we as a community have observed um, across the neuromuscular population in general that are, are issues such as are the children getting enough vitamin D because um, bone density is a critical issue, um, at, uh, otherwise children will be at risk of fractures. 
So I think that um, I can't do justice to that topic right now, but I think there are a number of issues in each individual child should have an assessment of nutrition in the context of how strong or weak they are, what their activity levels are, and uh, what their nutritional needs are. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I guess uh, there are two other themes that emerged in the, in the meeting, um, and I don't know, um, the, the, as we uh, keep young children alive longer with SMA, other systems start to emerge uh, as far as being involved, and I don't know if anybody wants to talk briefly about Dr. Kutheri's uh, work or uh, the heart involvement that uh, uh, one might see as, with the kids as they go longer. Kathy? So I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of information about SMA mouse models and we now have a great um, wealth of tools in the, in the mouse models. We're still trying to sort out as a community um, what those observations in the mouse model might mean for our patients with SMA. And I think a perfect example is um, Brian Kaspar and others have shown that mouse models um, clearly develop a heart problem. And that uh, may be contributing to death in, in some of those mice uh, at a time when perhaps their motor neuron disease wouldn't have killed them. This has been a challenge for us as a community to understand you know, how these therapies are working and why these uh, mice are dying. Uh, I want to be somewhat reassuring to say that um, you know, we don't see the same kind of heart problems um, to the same degree that we see in the SMA mouse models in terms of a heart contraction abnormality, what we call a cardiomyopathy. There are rare children with congenital cardiac defects that occur probably related to SMN uh, protein deficiency. Um, and we're still working that out. But by and large, um, I think that any child with SMA, we have to look at cardiac function, and that's part of the clinical sure. assessment that we, that we do. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Let's uh, add to that. The one sure. thing is, is that because you see the cardiac defect in the, in the mouse, it doesn't mean that an yes. autonomic uh, defect doesn't exist in humans that is in a different system because the heart rate in mice is a lot higher, and right. so it may just present in the mouse that way, and it may be completely different. There may be another issue human with situation. humans, yes, okay. And even one step further, um, I think that because mice aren't completely paralyzed like many of our type 1 babies, you know, you have to think of mice are getting more exercise and stress on the heart, so you could imagine that you could have an autonomic nervous system problem uh, um, and then you could imagine that the stress of exercise in the mouse really results in one phenotype, but in an SMA type 1 baby, it, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, what if thou, now we fix uh, the motor neuron phenotype in that baby, and that baby's now walking and running around, and I'm talking about, you know, our dream of all, all of this. If we had early intervention and the best case scenario, what if we weren't treating the autonomic nervous system problems or the heart problems, well then those problems could potentially emerge. Right. And so it's really important that we understand, you know, all of the, um, the areas where SMN function is important and to understand with any of these therapies where, that th where they're replacing the SMN in what cell types and what organs. Um, do we need to just put it into the brain and mm -hmm. spinal cord or do we need to put it into the heart and other organs? Right. Okay, great. I, I just ask everybody out in cyberspace, the questions are starting to, to, to trail off. So, so, uh, uh, so do, if you do have questions, do uh, send them in, but perhaps if not, we'll just make a few more uh, uh, points before wrapping up. I, uh, I just wanted to ask Arthur and Chris, for years uh, uh, we've been using mouse models uh, as, a, as a proving ground or testing ground for SMA therapies. Now you both have got experience with um, a larger animal models, a, a pig model, and just if each of you could just tell us your approach and, and why you feel it's an important and useful addition to the research area. Dr. Larson. I'll describe my models and then you can say <laughs> okay. why they're important. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so Dr. Monique Larson at the University of Missouri and several other colleagues at Missouri have developed <clears throat> two animal models, two large animal models of SMA. The first one does not actually have the disease, but it has the human SMN2 transgene in there, and it allows you to 
look in an uncomplicated model for compounds that modulate SMN2 splicing, whether that be a small molecule or an ASO, something like that. And those, those pigs are, are here, they are ready to roll, and the next model is an SMA swine model. And this will be a large animal model of SMA based upon SMN2. So it should be able to recapitulate the disease like humans and also allow for translational studies for compounds that alter SMN2 levels or SMN levels in general. Okay, so why is it important to have a, a pig model? So there are a number of reasons, but one of the biggest things is if you look at the mouse, it's got certain physiological differences between it and a, and a human, and the pig is a lot closer. So I'll just pick on a, on a few of them. So the first one is the blood-brain barrier in a pig and in man is closed at birth. That's not true in, in the mouse. So you can ask different questions about the drug. Secondly, obviously, pigs are a lot bigger than mice. And this actually becomes important because you have to know that your molecule, your therapeutic, actually gets everywhere that you need it to get. So for instance, one study that we actually has being done right now with the pigs that uh, Chris just talked about, Monique's, shall I call them Moni, Mon, Monique's pigs? Missouri pigs, <laughs> Missouri pigs. okay, is, um, to look at how well an antisense oligonucleotide of actually a slightly different chemistry, a morpholino chemistry, distributes in a large animal model. How far does it go? And that's important because you want to know that you're correcting all sections of the spinal cord. It also, we would hope, eventually, will give you an idea of how, once you have pigs with SMA, of how that clinical trial will look. What is the most effective time to introduce the reagent that's going to treat the disorder? Is it more effective early? Yes, we think so. How early? And is, that is very useful to do in a, a large animal model because it gives you a lot of predictors, not absolutes, but predictors of how the clinical trial for, effort, for finding efficacy will go. We have also made a pig where we've actually knocked down SMN using a different technique. And together with Brian Casper, we are testing how well introducing the gene therapy vectors will actually correct that pig. So I think there's a lot of uses for large animal models. Right. And just, uh, just quickly, uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Craner, uh, can you just in layman's terms, explain the new way that you've had of developing an SA model that you just told us about? Yeah, so we, we are trying to pursue a, a different twist on um, modulating splicing. In this case, to try to make splicing of SMN2 a little bit worse in order to uh, mimic uh, SMA-like disease. Uh, and so we have been successful in taking a mild mouse model of SMA and making it more severe, and we, we presented data trying to characterize the features of that model. And again, this has to do with generating a large number of, of different models that cover the various uh, severities of SMA, and in principle, this could also be used in other, uh, in other species, although that would require more work monkeys, for example. So the, the studies that, that uh, have been done in monkeys are typically for how the drug distributes um, throughout the spinal cord, for example, but it hasn't been possible to look at splicing correction because the monkey has uh, genes that, that splice perfectly well to begin with. So th those are possible uh, directions to go to if one oh. chooses to do that. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Kathy, as, as I just showed you, how expensive would newborn screening be and how would individual states adopt the SMA screening for newborns? So this is a, an important issue with newborn screening for SMA. So um, for newborn screening in general, um, the number of disorders for which we perform newborn screening has really escalated over the past 20 years. And now uh, most states screen more than, uh, for more than 35 different disorders 
by taking a little um, heel prick uh, from a baby at birth, putting it on um, several spots of blood on a filter paper card, and then sending it to a state laboratory where they will then uh, either perform the testing themselves for certain tests or send it to a specialty laboratory to do additional testing. Um, because technology has advanced, um, the, the cost increases have been relatively modest, uh, but the states largely help support that via uh, state funds and hospital funds. And so if you're, if you're talking about newborn screening for any given baby, uh, the cost of um, actually um, doing the, you know, having the cards available to the hospital, doing the entire analysis varies anywhere from $50 to $150 per child. If you add that up among all the children born in the U.S., that's, an, that's a large amount of funding. Um, to date, uh, the, the benefit versus the risk uh, in terms of what you're going to get from your funding has been very good because only disorders for which there are excellent therapies are screened for. Each time you add a new test or consider adding a new test, you potentially add more cost onto that. So uh, we've recently published, um, uh, my colleague Steve Doberwalski and I, in collaboration with Tom Pryor, uh, have published a, a cheaper version of a screening test so we could do some pilot studies for SMA. But by and large, uh, in order for SMA to be considered uh, mandated across the country or recommended for newborn screening across the country, it's going to require some proof that there's a clear therapy that children, if identified early, would clearly benefit, and that's why these pilot studies are so critical. So it costs about a half a million dollars per state to do this pilot study. And uh, we've been very fortunate to have um, uh, funding from the National Institutes of Child um, Health and Disease, uh, a branch of the NIH. And we've partnered with the American College of Medical Genetics to do that, uh, do some of the work through their newborn screening translational research network. So um, I think this pilot study will be very useful. And as we move forward with um, proving that some of these therapies may be effective, then we'll have the perfect storm where we can screen babies, identify them, and provide effective treatments. Great. Thanks very much. I just want to add one thing on that. The current screening technologies use what's called mass spec. For SMA, this is going to be a DNA-based test, as will a large number of other diseases yeah. moving forward. And so it will take a bit of shift in the technology being used. Right. All right, good point. Okay, here's a quick one from Wayne, uh, and I don't know if it's going to be a very satisfactory answer, Wayne. Are there any preliminary findings from the ISIS phase one trials that can be shared at this time? If so, what is the benefit side effects that have been seen? And Kathy or Adrian, Kathy? Do you know, um, I can't really speak about a phase one trial. Um, one of the, let me, I can talk in general about phase one trials, uh, but for ISIS, this is a very critical time for them and for all of the SMA therapeutics moving forward because this is the first of many exciting therapies to move forward. The purpose of a phase one study is to establish what is the right dose for a patient uh, that will distribute the drug to the tissues that we care to treat, and is that dose safe? Uh, and those are the most critical uh, questions for phase one. Mm -hmm. So in general, um, there's information about the trial on ISIS website. I don't know that off the top of my head, but um, uh, there are also details about the trial on nihclinicaltrials.gov. This particular trial entails delivery of a single dose via a, um, a uh, in, via delivery via a spinal tap into the um, fluid that surrounds the spine, and then looking um, uh, to see, again, what are the dosing characteristics, um, how, what levels do we get in the spinal fluid, what levels do we see in the systemic circulation, and how do those kids tolerate the therapy. And those are, um, those are very, it's very exciting to be moving mm -hmm. forward with the phase one trial. Thanks but for... we're just limited in what we can actually yes. say. Uh, uh, here's one uh, from SMA Parent addressed to you, a Adrian. In an interview speaking about oligos, you mentioned the word cure. The, uh, and then, I guess, have you figured out the challenges of potential spinal meningitis with so many necessary readministrations? Um, 
I probably will have to defer to Kathy on the more clinical things, but I, uh, it's not clear at this point how often that would have to be administered, and I, I don't believe that in principle that there are serious issues, but, but I, I really, okay. maybe you can comment on that in general. What? She said that you mentioned, she just made the statement that you mentioned the word cure in an interview. When did I say that? I, it doesn't say, it's, it's just. Um, we don't really know, you know, how much can be expected for any of these, these therapies that are moving to, towards clinical trials. That's what the clinical trials will establish. Uh, it, we don't know how early yes. um, the treatment has to be done, how effective it can be. I mean, that's what we're hoping to learn. Uh, of course, everyone is very hopeful. Yes. Although I guess the general one, th one thing I think is important, and yes. that's what John Porter says every yes. time we see him, and that's that a clinical trial is not a confirmation of a previous experiment. It is a completely new experiment in that you're looking at a completely different context. So there's wonderful in vitro data. There's wonderful mouse model work. But the reality is, is that every clinical trial is a completely new yes. study that almost has no bearing from before. Yes, it came from wonderful background work, but the reality is, is that it's a completely new experiment, yeah. Yeah. not a confirmation. Yeah. And then just a brief follow-up on delivery mechanisms. I mean, all of these different therapies are going to have different mechanisms of delivery. Um, this, the ISIS compound is delivered right now via, um, we do a spinal tap, basically. We take out a little bit of fluid. We put back in some uh, artificial spinal fluid, which um, is completely sterile and contains this um, oligonucleotide that is directed to uh, try to alter splicing of the SMN2 gene. Um, we, uh, this is a, um, a routine strategy for delivery of medications. Um, we do these every week, um, week in and week out in our hospital. Usually um, the most common indication is a child with cancer. And so most commonly that would be, give, that technique would be used for delivery of chemotherapies to the central nervous system where if you just gave it via the bloodstream, you wouldn't be able to effectively treat the cancer. Here we need to effectively reach motor neurons. We don't know, maybe, uh, maybe eventually we'll be able to figure out how to give an oral drug um, or um, a subcutaneous injection or an intramuscular injection or an IV infusion, um, and we won't have to do this. But in, in fact, um, uh, done uh, carefully, the, the risk of uh, spinal meningitis is exceedingly low. I mean, it, these are done uh, with very careful sterile preparation. We wear gowns and masks and we have sterile um, equipment. And I personally have never ever in my career, and I do spinal taps every week for diagnosis um, and treatment of children, and I've never been aware of a case where we've an, introduced an infection in a child by doing a spinal tap. So I think that should be a point of yeah. reassurance. Uh, yeah, very reassuring. Chris, here's one for you from Mary. How close, and you may have answered it, how close are you to having the porcine model of SMA ready for experimentation, or how close is, is perhaps Monique Larson? And, and then will there be any special dietary management of these animals once you begin research, or will they be fed standard milk or commercial porcine diet? Well, as they are pigs, they like Cheetos and Snickers quite a bit, but that's not going to be their diet. Oh, that's and, Dr. Larson. And apparently marshmallows in Ohio. But actually, in all seriousness, there are experiments that are ongoing for the SMN2 pigs. Those are oligo-based experiments and also an analysis of the SMN2 phenotype. Um, and. The SMA, the SMA pigs will hopefully be coming in the not too distant future, measured in months. Right. And the idea is to have a range of SMN levels which will then titrate in to produce increasingly less severe forms of SMA. But I think the most important thing is that um, the goal is to generate models that are useful for therapeutic studies. And what I mean by that is a pre-symptomatic phase that is more than 48 hours or 72 hours like the mice, so something in the, the weeks to months range, and then a clinically relevant crash 
and perhaps even a sustained period after that. And that is all obviously what we would like to see, and that's why uh, Dr. Monique Lorson has worked on titrating in different amounts of SMN. So the bottom line is one model is on the ground, the next one is coming. And I don't know about the diet. Okay. Uh, that's kind of beyond my scope, and yes. uh, vets, vets and Monique work with that. But, but also, I should not uh, uh, we give credit to Marie, because your final part of that question, would, would you or other clinicians see a use for dietary evaluation, especially being able to evaluate cells of different tissues, GI tract, et cetera, at an in vitro level? No, I think that's a great point, is yes. that, uh, as Dr. Burgess mentioned, that the pig really represents a much more human-like context, um, and so those kinds of experiments would be much more plausible and much more re related to the actual clinical, clinical setting. I mean, there are differences. They do chow down pretty heavily at the beginning of their life, uh, and the food that is used is standard uh, milk powder in the first few uh, days, and you have to right. give it every two hours. It's good fun. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yes, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, we've got a bit of a backlog of, of questions here. Uh, 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 Cindy from Jacksonville, what is the most promising drug trial that may be used in treatment of SMA? So what is the most promising drug, I guess what is the most promising drug on, uh, on the horizon for the treatment of SMA? I mean, I think there's three, I mean, it's the same thing, right? There's three treatments, and I, I would call them three drugs. There's gene therapy, there's the antisense oligo, and there's small molecules. Mm -hmm. I would say all of them, I'm, I'm, they're all very good, and which one is going to work the best, I actually can't predict. I, you know, if you take it, gene therapy has the advantage of a one-time dose, theoretically. Mm -hmm. uh, the antisense oligos have the advantage of being very specific for the target, so limited toxicity to it. And the small drugs have the advantage of convenience and um, a clear path that's been followed many times before in other disorders. Right. So I don't think there is one that's prefer preferential. Okay, all right. Um, here's uh, one from Terry uh, who wants to know how much muscle strength has been gained in the primate models using gene therapy. Um, and we'll just ask it again to Dr. Casper. Uh, uh, so, Brian, we're wondering how much muscle strength has been gained in the primate models using gene therapy? So, uh, just one, one point of, uh, I'll give two answers here. Um, we'll choose the one we like best. First, uh, we have been in non-human primates. Uh, I, the question is, has non-human primates gotten stronger uh, following gene delivery? Uh, the first point is our non-human primates, our monkeys, do not have SMA. So these are normal non-human primates. Uh, what we have used non-human primates for is to address a safety issue, address two issues. One is, can we get our product, our gene delivery, our gene into spinal motor neurons? And the answer that we have been able to achieve is yes. The second point is, if we give a dose that we're planning to give a child in a normal monkey, will it be safe and well tolerated? And we've done a six month study where we have evaluated these monkeys, uh, there's a total of four monkeys that have been dosed with a clinically relevant dose of our gene delivery, AEV9 SMN. And these non-human primates have been evaluated twice a day for normal behavior, for behavior and they've come out clean, uh, normal behavior, normal eating, their blood chemistries, their hematology, similar to when we go to the doctor and get blood pulled and they do chemistry panels, we have evaluated monthly over the course of six months after injection in the non-human primates and all of the numbers have come out identical, nearly identical to what a non-injected or a control-injected monkey 
uh, monkey's values would be. So our purpose of delivering AEV9 SMN would not make a stronger monkey given that our monkeys don't have SMA. However, we are in a human clinical trial right now on muscle enhancement, which we have thought about, numbers of studies have thought about this and have been performed in spinal muscular atrophy to increase muscle mass and muscle strength. And there's a variety of approaches uh, to evaluate, uh, to try to get muscles to be stronger. And indeed, this could be beneficial for some types of SMA. We don't know the answer is completely, but likely less severe SMA muscle enhancement may have an advantage. We're currently in um, human clinical trials based upon both mouse and non-human primate studies for muscle enhancement using a gene delivery approach to inhibit this gene called myostatin. Um, we have tested non-human primates for the ability of our product AEV1 folostatin to increase muscle mass and strength in the non-human primate? And then secondly, is it safe and well tolerated? Once again, this program, this gene delivery program has come out with, with a clean bill of health as far as safety and toxicity. The FDA gave the green light to initiate a human clinical trial in two diseases, inclusion body myositis and Becker muscular dystrophy. We have spinal muscular atrophy on the radar screen uh, for the potential to, uh, for this product. Uh, we're moving forward, though, in that phase one, phase two clinical trials to determine uh, the safety in humans as well as the potential efficacy in humans. It's early days. What I can note right now is that we're two and a half months into the human trial and there have been no problems. So there have been no serious adverse events. So we're keeping our fingers crossed and certainly we're happy that it's safe and well tolerated so far in humans. Great, thanks a lot. Um, and, and so I think, I think we'll just do another two or three questions before wrapping it up and going for a very well-deserved uh, dinner. Um, we have uh, Steve Parry uh, emailing in from Australia asking a question which a number of people have asked about. Is it likely that the three therapies will be used in combination or even all three together? And I don't know who wants to. Arthur? Um, I must admit that that hasn't actually really uh, come up yet. I suspect, in, at least in the first instance, just because of uh, the different tox issues, they'll all be used individually. Once they're used individually, then it could be considered to, to combine them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, given the nature of the different therapies, mm -hmm. that you would necessarily get huge benefit from, from combining them because they all work on the principle that we're increasing SMN. And so as long as they have sufficient dosage or sufficient, sufficient level of increase of SMN, adding another thing that increases SMN is not necessarily go going to improve right. the matters. That, that's what I would say. However, you could see something like, uh, I don't know, gene therapy, you know, in later years, maybe you have to supplement with something else. That's a possibility. I don't, mm -hmm. I think it's unforeseeable at the moment. Right. And Kathy, your thoughts as, as somebody at the coal face? I think, um, I think that will undoubtedly happen as we get proven therapies, but as, as Dr. Burgess mentioned, um, we do have to, to really carefully prove that the therapies um, work first. And we're going to want to have, uh, once you um, take a new therapy and, and take it out to the human population for the first time, there's a, a, a also longer phase in which you want to evaluate safety and efficacy. And so we want to be cautious about saying we would do that too quickly. But I think absolutely there's going to be circumstances in the more distant future where we're going to want to combine therapies. Uh, and hopefully we will have three or four or five therapies depending on the circumstances that, that would be. And I'll give an example. Um, so if uh, a patient has had a rod and it makes it difficult to access 
providing uh, um, uh, uh, therapy through the spinal fluid. There are other ways to do that. Certainly we can get a neurosurgeon to help us and do the injection up higher and things like that. But it may be that that patient will decide, gosh, there's two or three different therapies. I don't want to do the um, intrathecal injection therapy. I'm going to try this other therapy. And we've seen this happen in multiple sclerosis where when I did my training, uh, it, even uh, in the mid-90s, we still had no therapies besides steroids for multiple sclerosis. And now we have many, many different kinds of therapies. Uh, and sometimes a patient won't tolerate one therapy as well as another therapy. So um, every individual is unique, and um, there may be some individuals, for instance, who can't receive the viral therapy because they have antibodies to a particular viral vector. Mm -hmm. Or we'll have to give them a combination medicine with the viral uh, therapy, uh, stem cell therapy, uh, viral uh, uh, gene delivery vector. With stem cell, um, again, if you've got a baby that's lost most of their motor neurons, that's, that's going to be hard to replace them all up and down the spinal cord. But if you've got an adult uh, who already has a fusion of their spine and, and they can't, um, and they have significant muscle weakness in their legs, uh, maybe there would be an injection uh, of stem cells that you'd put in the muscles of the thighs or something. I mean, and I think Brian was alluding to the idea that you might deliver um, you know, intramuscular um, gene therapies or uh, right. other kinds of therapies. So I, I think the future's wide open. We don't, right. we really, as, as someone once said, we can't predict the future, right? Okay. So. <laughs> Brian. Yes. I, I think I'd just like to, uh, you know, one, one would like to think that all three of these have yes. been proven to work and that we could probably combine them and get them all to work synergistically or additively for, for the best possible scenario. And indeed, that may come. But I think where, where we stand right now in these early clinical trials, from the preclinical studies, from the ISIS oligonucleotides to morpholinos to gene therapy to the drugs, all very promising programs where the combinations are happening. They're actually happening right now. And I'll give you just one example. For example, if you put the oligonucleotides, the, the ISIS chemistry, directly into uh, the CSF, one gets a response, something like a 14, 15-day increase of survival. When you put a gene delivery throughout the systemic uh, population, uh, through, through the systemic blood, one, at the right dose, one sees a complete rescue. Now, I don't necessarily know that, uh, that Adrian followed our systemic gene delivery uh, thoughts in, in his recent work, but his combination of, of following the field and thinking about potential other targets, potentially increased uh, delivery, actually created remarkable results when he did his follow-up studies with the ISIS systemic gene delivery, uh, systemic delivery, and had some really amazing results. The beautiful thing here, I guess my point is, is that our groups are talking, we will be learning from, and this is, this is the power of us working together as a community, because the combination of us talking and thinking about the clinical trials and our various approaches are really going to complement themselves to actually create the best clinical trial and potentially the best drug for patients. Thank you very much for that thorough exposition. Um, so I th I, I, we are meant to be going theoretically until 8.30. Uh, so uh, I think what we might do, because there seems to be a hiatus in the questions, is to call a 15-minute recess uh, where if there's uh, th those listening around the globe in the cosmos with questions about SMA, please please email them in, but we'll just take a, a short break from the webcast now and, uh, and then return in about 15 minutes and see if there's other questions at that stage. Thanks very much for your brilliant performance, guys. Very impressive. Proud to know you. Now I have to go find out what the hockey score is. <laughs>
at the risk of uh, being controversial is that plastin is a potential modifier rather than a fully identified modifier. And the reason I would say that is because it, it's been shown to have increased expression in certain SMA patient groups, but it's not the only thing that could have changed there because you're looking at expression levels. It's to date, in, when, when plastin has been looked at in mice by overexpression, it really doesn't seem to modify the phenotype. So what I would say is currently the data is not strong enough to really have uh, a program that would look at molecules that would upregulate plastin as opposed to upregulate SMN, which is definitely critical. So it, it would be what I would call a relatively weak target at present. Disease. It, it doesn't. Right. And does it tell us anything biologically about the disease from your perspective? Um, well, if it doesn't have an impact, no. If it mm. does have an impact, maybe. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, well put. Have there been any studies done on mice or pigs with SMA to see if they could have a metabolic disorder or mitochondrial dysfunction, such as seen clinically with human SMA? And if not, why not? Dr. Larson, do I see you? From the pig's perspective, there is no SMA pig model yet. There is the knockdown model that Dr. Burgess referred to earlier, and that is just at the very initial description. But <clears throat> there is no SMA pig today, hopefully very soon. What was the rest of it, Alec? Uh, well, mice, uh, has anybody <coughs> studied? Um, there have been some studies in mice. They're, they're relatively limited, but I would also say uh, how strong is the evidence that mitochondria are involved in the human disorder, I think, can also be put on uh, mm -hmm. the, the deck. So there are limited studies. To, to my view, none of them convincingly uh, show a huge role for mitochondria. It's certainly a possibility, but it's probably not the major lead that people are following it currently in terms of the function of SMA. Great. And Kathy? I'd say taking it back to the SMA patients, um, <clears throat> you know, there's no question that um, patients with SMA have metabolic abnormalities. There's not good studies to suggest they definitely have primary mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, many neurodegenerative disorders have secondary um, de defects in energy metabolism. And in SMA in particular, in the weakest um, children, uh, when you've lost a tremendous amount of your muscle mass, you've taken away essentially an organ that helps serve as a buffer for metabolic pathways. You've, you've disrupted a source of glycogen for um, uh, mobilization of uh, blood sugar levels, you've, um, you've changed um, uh, the way those muscles work. I mean, even with um, couch potatoes, uh, those of us who are couch potatoes versus more active individuals, we know there's metabolic dysfunction. I mean, diabetes type 2, um, you know, has associated metabolic dysfunction. That doesn't mean it's a primary part of the disease process per se. It may be uh, in part secondary in, in some cases to obesity and sedentary lifestyle. So I think we're still working that out. And I think the tough thing with um, the, the mouse models and the pig models at this point is, well, the pig models, there's not been enough time. In the mouse models, um, there have been so many other questions to ask. And, um, and getting metabolite levels in blood from mice is a little more challenging. I think with with some of the new tools we have going forward, um, perhaps in the second SMA biomarker study, maybe we can start to answer those questions a little bit better. Thanks. Uh, Kathy, while we have you, uh, my fellow Canadian Brad Fisher writes, why do dietitians still calculate diets using regular BMI and growth charts and not go the extra mile of measuring our children's physical makeup? 
I agree that each child is different, like regular children, but there's also a lot of common traits. Diet and the NIV protocol are the major reason why children are living longer with, S with SMA, yet the community of parents have to calculate diets much differently than the professionals. Uh, so that's halfway through. Do you want to tackle that and I can give you the other half? Um, so I think that um, as a community, I would say that one of the most contentious areas um, in, in trying to, to um, sort of um, have clinicians and families engage with each other has been dietary and nutritional management. Um, it's not been an area where we've partnered as well as we could have. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of distrust between um, uh, recommendations by um, dietitians in hospitals and the feeling by many parents that there's not enough knowledge uh, by dietitians and nutritionists and clinicians, particularly neurologists. Um, we're not trained in nutritional management. Um, it's not our primary uh, area of expertise. We're not the primary care doctor, per se. But I do think we've made tremendous progress. And um, there have now been um, uh, yearly meetings where at this meeting we've had dietitians come and try to get together and, and make alliances and educate the rest of the community about these issues. Uh, I think that actually parents doing this themselves without reaching out to their community and partnering with their dietitians and nutritionists actually do a little bit of a disservice. And, um, because we have to partner and we have to educate each other and that's where we're most effective. When, when we talk about the NIV diet what, uh, protocol, what is the NIV protocol? He's talking about um, survival in, in type 1 in particular, long-term survival is thought to be predominantly due to um, the non-invasive ventilatory management protocols yes. and cough assist and right. all the things that go with that in addition to um, dietary and nutritional management, which is proactive. He finishes up by, by saying, I believe diet should be calculated optimally and more often, like every four months, yet I've seen diets of children that are recalculated only annually using the calculations for regular children. When can we see accepted diet protocols that take into account SMA type 1's physical makeup? Often parents have to go behind physicians' back to properly calculate the diet. So for type 1 um, and type 2 and type 3, every child's unique. Um, I would say during the first year of life, absolutely the diet needs to be adjusted quite frequently. As they get a little bit older, um, what we've noticed in our, in our longer surviving patients is that their metabolism is low and you might not mm -hmm. make a lot of change. It might be every six months or, or so that you might need to see that child. But again, this is a two-way street and uh, you have to make an appointment with your doctor and put it in their face that you want help with dietary nutritional management. You're not going to take no for an answer. You want access uh, to dietitians and nutritionists who will address your needs. And um, that's really going to require an effort by the community um, in a proactive way. And I think um, the dietitians in the community um, have been very proactive now about trying to get together and, and trying to get some articles written about this. Definitely, they're using the wrong growth curves for these kids, but we don't have an SMA growth chart right now. We don't have a neuromuscular growth chart. Right. So we have to do the best we can. And if you have a question about, you know, don't think silently to yourself, uh, boy, what an idiot, tell them, boy, aren't, you're <laughs> yes. an idiot. Uh, there we go. Uh, you know, or <laughs> yes. say it more nicely, right. ideally. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then actually engage them in a conversation. Right. And I think that's what we need to do on, on right. a daily basis with these dietary nutrition issues or we won't solve it. Brad asks in a separate question, one that I, I have to be honest, I don't completely understand. Why are therapies to strengthen the vestibular system so overlooked in SMA treatment and care, including oral therapy? I've, n I've not heard of a vestibular therapy. So um, I think that um, you know, there's a lot that goes into brain development and, and um, postural reflexes and responses that has to do with movement. Right. And SMA1 babies in general, um, we, we haven't paid a lot of attention to that. There's actually some beautiful studies done by uh, physiotherapists, PhD physiotherapists, showing that in, in children, younger babies with um, cerebral palsy, that just carrying babies around and moving them, yes. like, uh, you know, wearing them when they're infants around, uh, whether they're weak or not, that actually stimulation helps promote brain and, and musculoskeletal uh, involvement. And I, right. I do think that's an area of interest that we can think about going forward. But right. why, I mean, I think we, 
we've been caught up in many areas to try to address many things. Um, and hippotherapy is a form of vestibular therapy, if you will, movement therapy. Um, right. you know, there's lots of different options for that out there. I think uh, we're getting close to having to say goodbye to Brian Casper and Arthur Burgess, so I, I'll just take the uh, delight in putting you guys at the spot one more time. Brian, this time next year, if your year goes as you'd like it to, uh, what areas would you like to be able to report on in 12 months uh, for the webinar then? So uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're within a week of initiating an FDA-sanctioned toxicology and biodistribution study for our systemic gene delivery. Uh, it's a six-month study as dictated by the Food and Drug Administration in our pre-IND conference call with them. Uh, we can predict based upon the studies, not with 100 percent certainty, but we feel confident that we will pass the high criteria for safety to take this forward into an investigational new drug application to the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, our hopes is the aspect that we can navigate through the regulatory process which uh, currently resides at the Food and Drug Administration, mm -hmm. uh, the recombinant advisory committee, as well as our institutional review board to initiate a human clinical trial. Now that being said, we are working almost night and day right now on the planning stages of having clinical grade material available for that uh, phase one clinical trial. So our hopes within a, a year mm -hmm. is the aspect that we are in human clinical trials treating patients uh, in our uh, first dose escalation study for our planned clinical trial enrollment is for type 1 SMA patients. Uh, once again, we have a lot of work to do with navigating the regulatory uh, departments, the Food and Drug Administration, to create our case. I think we have the team in place to be able to, to create the most compelling case uh, to move us into human clinical trials uh, as quickly as possible. And I, I get to work alongside uh, Arthur Burgess, uh, John Kissel, uh, Jerry Mandel, uh, as well as uh, uh, Steve Kolb, as well as all of our clinical and regulatory folks mm -hmm. to try to create the situation that FDA will give us the green light. So I right. am very hopeful that we can report that uh, we have product, we are inpatients, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully we can structure this in the way that we can go in on the first trials to do the best human clinical trial, right. trying to capture safety as well as, most importantly, outcome measures that is going to try to advance this product uh, forward. And we should just caution people that, much like the ISIS trial being a phase one, the numbers will be likely quite small as far as study entrants go. That's a good point, Alex. Uh, a phase one uh, slash two clinical trial for uh, for SMA type one patients, we're talking anywhere between four to twelve patients. Mm -hmm. right, right, but it's an important first step. Arthur, a hard act to follow. Well, <laughs> you'll be working with Brian. Yeah, <laughs> I'll definitely be working with Brian. <laughs> um, but. Um, I think one of the other things I'd like to see move forward by next year is to actually firmly have the morpholino chemistry firmly in uh, like the required IND study right. so that it can move into clinical trials as well. So that would be my plus the Columbus thing. the Columbus Blue Jackets in the playoffs as well. Is it, is it? Well, that would be nice, but we can't <laughs> hope for too much. Okay, all right, great. Th thanks both for for your participation here, and I, I know you'll have to slip off at some point, and we, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, we are once again at a hiatus for questions. If there are other questions out there, please uh, uh, send them on in. Um, I, I just. Uh, 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 there we go. See you guys. Actually, I'm I guess I can come there if I stop bleeding. Bye-bye. Uh, Kathy, uh, just a, a question that had come on earlier that I hadn't gotten to. Uh, as far as the number of recruits, it seems like the number of treatments available might outstrip the actual number of, of uh, recruits available to fill the 
patient tri trials, should we be making more assiduous efforts at reaching out to clinical centers throughout the states and even Canada to, to get them involved in addition to the obvious Boston's, uh, um, New York and, and Utah? Do you, is that a, a initiative you'd like to see? Yeah, I think um, there are still too few centers of excellence uh, for, um, you know, diagnosing and treating SMA patients. And I think it's going to reach a critical juncture. Um, you know, there, are, there were more sites, obviously, but yeah. those require, uh, you know, as Brian was alluding to, it takes a village. <laughs> it yes. takes a lot of personnel and people who are trained and know how to handle regulatory things and, and know uh, and can meet all the needs of, of doing these complex kind of trials, whether it be with a type 1 population or a type 3 adult uh, ambulatory population. So right. I think that we have our challenges ahead of us, but we need to keep moving forward in that regard. And um, I'm very optimistic we can do that. Um, whether or not we can um, expand those efforts um, using our own resources within the SMA communities coming together or whether we need to partner with Neuronext or industry, how we're going to do that exactly, whether the SMA Treatment Acceleration Act will finally uh, mm -hmm. be approved, right. Right. that would be very exciting. Uh, but I think that um, having, you know, for ALS, uh, look at how much uh, money and resources, um, you know, we have ALS centers of excellence across the United States. You know, you've got a similar number of SMA patients out there, but, um, and, and, you know, cystic fibrosis, that's a similar situation. And I think uh, in order to make true progress, we need to have centers that can meet the clinical needs of these patients, that can provide the supportive care, and do the clinical trials in tandem. And we're not even close. Right. Okay. Not even close. All right. Uh, so your, your work not yet done. Our first, our first email from England being characteristically p polite. Thanks so much for your very informative Q&A session. Uh, this is from Leah's parents. We have heard that the tetracycline derivative-based therapy by Paratech, question mark, is progressing very quickly down, down the development pipeline. Would you be able to share your thoughts on how this therapy compares as regards efficiency in animal models to ASO gene therapy and, re and uh, repligens quinazoline. There's, so, there's very little published information available. And you see it entering human trials in the near future. I don't know if anybody can speak on the Paratech, Kathy? I think that um, we, I think we have overstated the case that there's three therapies. Yep. I mean, there's many more than three therapies coming forward. Um, uh, Paratech, I mean, any of these therapies, you know, each is coming along at a different rate. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where the, the therapy from Paratech is. It does look like it's promising. But, but how these are going to pass all the toxicology study hurdles and, and other issues is not clear. Repligen uh, actually has its, uh, um, you know, um, uh, drug in um, healthy phase one human volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very exciting. So we've emphasized the ISIS trial simply sure. because that's the first in human novel therapy that we've had in some time. Right. But there are many others that are coming forward at, at various rates, and I think that any one of them could jump forward right. a little faster or could get held up I right. think, at any point in the, right. in the course. Although, I, I mean, if you're going, as far as the exciting animal uh, results, perhaps one hasn't seen that to the same extent. Yeah, I think that's true. I think if you if you rank uh, order, you know, um, if you talk to um, uh, someone who's working on AAV9, of course, that's going to be the top of the list. And if you talk with someone who's working on antisense oligo, maybe that'll be top. It really depends on um, the the situation you're you're putting it in. And um, I, I think again, so, so suppose um, uh, Dr. Kaspar's work goes well, and we get um, AAV9 mm -hmm. uh, delivered SMN into type one babies. I, I think we have to be patient. And and uh, again, the first step for any of these trials is to show safety, and and figure out the right dose to take forward. And then we're going to have to be creative. Getting back to your other question yeah. about, you know, there's not a lot of patients. There are a lot of patients. Right. Uh, there are a lot of patients at different phases of the disease, and we have to be creative about which therapies show the most promise for a given population. Right. And then we have to be smart about how we spend our resources and, right. and know that there's scarce resources and we have to use them right. wisely. Uh, Chris, perhaps for you, uh, there, are there different oligos in the ISIS project? And if so, how, what is the data showing? And wh where, are they, where are they in this research? 
Adrian, you want to step outside of the room while we have to discuss? <laughs> yeah. Are there are there different oligos? I'm sorry. <laughs> are there different oligos being used in the ISIS project? Perhaps Adrian is okay. better equipped right. to address that. <laughs> but but just, one one thing I think that is important um, <clears throat> is that there there are certainly multiple genetic targets, and the one the ones that have been the best developed, whether or not they're from ISIS and Adrian's group <clears throat> using the ISIS chemistry or the Morpholino chemistry that Arthur has talked about, right. um, there are other opportunities. And I think that is really where SMA is infinitely ahead of many other disease contexts, and that there's so much great molecular biology that has been based that is the, the foundation for therapeutics. So there are other regulatory elements out there that might also serve as therapeutic targets for other kinds of antisense oligonucleotides. So, oh, I mean, I think you, yeah. though that, that is really a strength to SMA. So I think that sure. we'll see in the future. Adrian, do you feel comfortable just? I, I can comment a few things. Um, yeah, I mean, Arthur mentioned three classes of drugs, but I mean one of those classes was small molecules, so that pretty much encompasses um, right. what PTC Therapeutics talked about, the quinazolines that are in phase one, uh, the paratech compound, which is the tetracycline derivative. I, I was involved in the early phases of that work when it was in, in, in cell-free systems, and, and I'm not involved in that, so I can't really comment, but right. uh, I mean I think some of the things have moved more rapidly to um, clinical trials, partly based on um, how effective they proved in the animal models, and, and um, that's, that sort of thing changes all the time. And there are logistical issues, you know, for each approach. Uh, the more, the merrier, I would say. I, I think as far as any sense drugs, the principle is the same. You can use different chemistries. And, right. so, um, and, and I guess Arthur has been using morpholinos and showing some effect. In, yeah, it, correct, and mice. And so then they have to currently deal with how to manufacture large amounts right. and, and uh, um, go through all the regulatory process. Right. So, so it, they're not as far ahead as uh, obviously the ISIS. Yeah, so, Kathy. I think that um, to say someone's far ahead or less far ahead, you know, this could change, turn yeah, on a overnight. dime. Because, yeah. you know, just give you an example. Um, you know, uh, when we were at this meeting last year, I had a completely different list about which I thought was the most promising and least promising. I'm not going to, and this changes all the time, mm -hmm. because people are tweaking their compounds, they're identifying better compounds, mm -hmm. they're, they're working really hard, and until we actually get these into human clinical trials and compare them right. uh, in our human population, we don't know what we're going to see. And it could and be different so from mice. They, they could know. be different from mice. And so I think that the fact that there are so many items coming forward yeah. uh, provide both a challenge and an opportunity. Shots on goal. Yep. Yeah. And the opportunity is that we have many to take forward. The challenge is you can't easily fundraise for all of them. Right. And um, getting venture capitalists behind, uh, you know, novel drug therapies for a rare disease that may not serve a huge population, that's a challenge. Hmm. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't matter if you have 10 good ones if only two get funded. And I, and I think that that's where um, this competition, again, and this is science, this is, you know, we all want to see the best therapy come forward and the scientists all want to make the best therapy come forward. But you don't know what's going to happen uh, going forward. Kathy, this is from Vincent, who says, hi, Kathy. Just one small thing. Oh, sure, Chris. <laughs> you know, I think if you look back a couple of years, what you'll notice is that it used to be considered that gene replacement or gene therapy was considered harebrained at best. Dangerous. Dangerous. <laughs> uh, delivery to the CNS, uh, that was just never going to happen. It was a hurdle that wasn't even worth looking at. Mm -hmm. And it was funded, you know, 10 years ago. Yep. Um, through um, through fight SMA to do a lentiviral yep. delivery, and <clears throat> it was essentially dropped because the the community, the field at large, didn't embrace it. Now, as it turns out, a number of the hurdles associated with that, like delivery uptake into motor neurons, have been overcome, and all of a sudden, what's the leading therapy? 
yep. you know, there's an incredible excitement about gene therapy, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And that was not true three, four, three years, five yeah. years ago. And it was, it was not true 10 years ago, period. Not, not true, yes. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, so, so, Kathy, uh, Vincent is asking, hi, Kathy, what is the current status of the SMA, SMA stem cell clinical trial? It was put on hold two years ago. When can we expect to see a clinical stem cell trial? Um, so I, I assume you're talking about um, uh, California stem cell, but there are stem cell trials going forward in motor neuron disease, and um, uh, Dr. Nick Boulos was at the meeting today talking about their experience about injection of um, stem cell therapies into um, the lower um, lumbar uh, spinal cord regions in patients with ALS. And I think the exciting thing about that is that um, the first uh, safety phase uh, has, has passed, that phase one trial was a success, mm -hmm. and they are moving forward with those therapies. Now, how, what is the right stem cell and what is the right patient population has been a point of controversy. It's been a point of controversy for the companies involved, for the investigators and scientists. It's been a point of co controversy for um, investors. It's been a point of controversy for um, the, um, everybody, really. So, it's been but it was it was the most uh, exciting therapy, mm -hmm. you know, two or three years ago, because um, you know there was such excitement about replacing, you know, uh, motor neurons in, in spinal cord. Uh, we know that um, there's a lot of promise to those mm -hmm. therapies for patients who have severe motor neuron loss potentially. But as Dr. Burgess said, there's a lot of science that we need to go through, and, and we need more clinical experience. And we don't know offhand uh, when comparing different studies if they weren't done in exactly the same way from lab to lab, um, you know, what's going to be a better therapy or not. I, I will say that um, I think Dr. Burgess's points that, you know, we need to kind of use our animal model data and, and we're trying to compare and contrast these studies against each other. And, you know, it's, it's really fallen off the chart compared to other therapies that have surpassed it. But that could change again three years from now. Absolutely. So I, I wouldn't want to make any predictions about that. Here's a question from Michelle. Um, I, I just throw it out there, uh, probably to you, though, Kathy. There are many new families being diagnosed. And given the no hope statement, why are there still doctors' hospitals out there not knowing what is going on about SMA? The technology and communication today is much better than 14 years ago. How are the experts relaying this information? You know, I think um, anyone who's following this year's election knows um, that our health care system is in the limelight and our health care system is broken. That being said, um, most uh, families of SMA1 children in Europe do not have access to the technology or resources we have in the, in the United States. And we have incredibly resourceful parents who have raised thousands of dollars in fundraisers with uh, different networks. And so I think that... Um, Again, uh, th this is not on the agenda of the leading health uh, issues facing us, let's be honest. SMA is way down on the list. Um, you know, example of that, um, I saw the, the, um, the plan for how we would deal with an influenza epidemic at our hospital last year. And uh, the plan entailed refusing to actually uh, provide any uh, ventilator support for, for uh, babies with severe neuromuscular disease because you had to, they had it tiered triage. to uh, triage to the healthier, uh, more robust people uh, first. And, you know, uh, as much as we don't want to talk about rationing, there's only a limited number of health care dollars, and so that's why we have to be creative as a community to figure this out. Wow. So, big job. Huge job. So the questions do seem to have... Um, have, have come to an end. Um, can, can I ask you guys in a year? Uh, Kathy. <laughs> next, <laughs> next year at this time, what would you like to be relating to the public at large? Um, I would like to see um, at least another therapy, novel therapy, um, you know, uh, be uh, maybe even two novel therapies be in um, at least phase one trials in patients with SMA. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see that um, the, the uh, ISIS therapy is moving forward into phase two trials. And I'm hoping that um, in the meantime, we've been able to come up with some ideas as a community as to how to better support the structure and infrastructure yeah. for these trials that yeah. we need going forward. Great. Chris. 
I'll kind of change gears a little bit <clears throat> out of clinical trials and say, I think it would be nice if we understood what the SMN protein did and why people develop SMA. Um, it's a question that we've tried to address yeah. many years in a row. There to and go. conclusively, and yet again, we have decided to punt. Um, we don't know, and I think that's an important component in developing effective therapeutics. We know that if we have more SMN protein, that's good, but why is it good? Where does it need to be good, and when does it need to be good? So there's kind of a series of very simple questions that still needs, they need to be addressed, and I would take any one of the when, where, or what's. Uh, so, okay, well put. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with all of those. I, I certainly am looking forward to uh, the phase one trials for the ISIS compound to be completed, and hopefully a year from now it will have advanced further. It's going to be very important to know exactly what to measure and how to measure it to make sure that uh, any of these strategies is actually effective in the clinic. It's not that straightforward, and, and a lot of work continues Great. to be done to set those parameters, so I think that's critical. Uh, but I agree that you have less SMN and somehow you have disease and we don't fully yeah. grasp how that or happens. How and so all these uh, different models and systems that um, have been described and worked on for some time are, are um, raising new questions, right. a lot of interesting questions, and, and I think a year from now we'll know more. Great. On that note, uh, I'd like to thank you guys, uh, the incredible shrinking panel, but thanks very much for <laughs> hanging in to the end. And uh, thanks all those that, that, that sent questions in and also that just watched. I think I'm right in saying it will be available uh, at the Fight SMA webpage to, to review if you miss sections of it uh, in the future. It will be posted. And thanks again, and we hope to uh, do this same time next year. And your shrinking panel wants to thank those of you in the UK and Australia and all of those faraway places who stayed up or got up early for this. Right. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and Daniel Chan and the, the gang here who set it up as well.